Hi, my name is Marie Romagnano, founder of Healthcare Professionals for Divine Mercy. I'm happy to present to you our educational conferences that integrate medicine, bioethics, and the spirituality of divine mercy in patient care for healthcare professionals. Because of their importance, even if you're not a medical professional, we invite you to join us. Today, I wish to offer a summary of a conference talk given by Scott Nelson titled, The Impact of John Paul II on the Profession of Nursing in Healthcare. Scott is a catastrophic injury nurse case manager and a hematology oncology nurse. In his introductory remarks, Scott noted that St. John Paul II continues to have a profound impact on healthcare as evidenced by frequent references to his teaching on human suffering contained in his encyclicals, apostolic letters, and other documents, and by his personal witness, as he was no stranger to suffering over his lifetime. In 1984, Pope John Paul II wrote his apostolic letter on the meaning of human suffering as a response to his own suffering resulting from the assassin's bullet on May 13, 1981, and a lengthy recovery to health. This apostolic letter is a tremendous gift St. John Paul II has left to the church and all people who grapple with ill health, injuries, and pain. As healthcare professionals, we come across human suffering in all of its forms, whether it be physical suffering, moral, spiritual, and psychological. Human suffering is inseparable, both in our personal lives and our work as healthcare professionals. Suffering remains an intangible mystery and remains to be one of man's deepest questions. By our faith and the need of the heart, we as healthcare professionals are called to respond to our brothers and sisters in distress. St. John Paul II teaches us in this document the meaning and the intrinsic value of suffering. There he states, in order to perceive the true answer to the why of suffering, we must look to the revelation of divine love, the ultimate source of the meaning of everything that exists. Christ sacrificing himself for us all gave a new meaning to suffering opening up a new dimension, a new order, the order of love. In Scott's presentation, we see how St. John Paul II brings us deep into the meaning of human suffering so that we, as healthcare professionals, can touch our patients' hearts in a way to give them both renewed strength and hope. I invite you to listen to the complete presentation by Scott speaking on the impact of John Paul II on the profession of nursing and healthcare. So the, um, the objectives of the talk today is, is to prevent just simply how St. John Paul II's writings and also the example of his life can impact our various professions in healthcare. I would like to begin to explain how St. John Paul II became so prominent in my life. First and foremost, it is the result of the timing of my birth being born in 1955. And this positioned my life right in the heart of being part of the John Paul II generation. And I think probably many of us here can feel that we're, we're part of that generation and to have experienced a pontificate of 26 years and, uh, and been able to experience his presence on earth and be canonized a saint within our lifetime. It's just a pretty amazing thing. Um, so back in 1978, I was also in my early 20s, and um, I launched into my first career, which was dairy farming. And this picture is a picture of our farm. Uh, the land went right to the Canadian border, overlooking Lake, Lake Champlain. It was a very majestic farm. And I'd have to say uh, farming in general, especially dairy farming, has a monastic uh, quality to it. It's seven days a week. It's a lifestyle. Um, the repetitive motion of milking the cows in the morning in a milking parlor and just uh, quiet early in the morning, uh, it's, it's pretty special. 
And also during this period, uh, I was in my early 20s at this time, it included the sudden death of my father at a fairly young age. And as you can imagine, it was a tender time. And then three weeks later, Karo Wojtyla, Archbishop of Krakow, stunned the world and was elected Pope on October 16th in 1978. I was jarred by my father's death being so sudden, but it also was a time of grace. At this time in my life spiritually, I was not following closely a Pope's thoughts and actions. And this was unusual for me to be so taken by this Holy Father. So I wanted to know more about John Paul II. And so early in its pontificate, there was not much reading material. There was no Amazon, no internet, um, to where you could get a book, you know, overnight, two days. Uh, I traveled all the way from the Canadian border, went to the biggest city in Vermont where we would go shopping, which would be Burlington. And I went to the best, you know, Christian or Catholic bookstore you can find, and they had one book. And there were no books on his life yet. Um, and I think the first book that I ran into about his life was a book by Andre Frosard, which was called Be Not Afraid, who knew uh, the Holy Father personally. But I did come across a book, and I grabbed it. It was called Sign of Contradiction. And in March 1976, he was asked to provide a retreat to the papal household in the Roman Curia, various priests and cardinals. And sign of contradiction is the retreat he had given to them. And the book was over my head, as you can imagine. And, uh, but as a whole, when I read the book, it affected me deeply. There was something about the book and the message that it had I was able to grasp. And, um, and I guess you could say from that point on, I was you know, an official member of the John Paul II generation. Um, it could not have come at a more providential time for me with the recent death of my father. And from that point on, I would follow uh, John Paul II on his journeys and his writings. I continued to farm for several more years and then decided to change my career. I sold my cows and that financed my way into nursing school to pay for my education there. And deep inside, I like to say that um, John Paul II spiritually affected me in a way that uh, drew me to change careers and become a nurse. My entire nursing career consisted of working in hematology, oncology, and in transplant nursing. And, you know, I think it dovetail well with uh, Dr. Sobeck's talk on transplant, uh, him being a transplant physician, and I was on the other side of that, but I was the nurse. And, um, and um, patients would be with us for uh, weeks to months, going through chemotherapy, transplant, ventral engraftment. And the hospitalization, the transplant could go well. Uh, it could be a most difficult hospitalization and sometimes result in death. And I'd have to say, you know, you know I was trying to think of a, a word to describe what it's like, and there's a a rawness of doing that type of nursing. And I don't mean it in a negative way, but it, it kind of mixes the intensity of, because in this type of nursing, you get to know patients not for days, you get to know them for weeks, months, years, they're in and out of the hospital. And when a person comes in for transplant, they're in the hospital for a minimum of three to four weeks and sometimes longer. If it's an aloe transplant like Dr. Sobek who is, uh, describing. And there are tender moments when you're a nurse in a transplant unit and there's a very different uh, lens you s look through when you're a nurse compared to being a physician. You know, when you're a nurse, you're, you're at the bedside day and night, three o'clock in the morning, in the afternoon, long hours where the physicians are with the patient for periodic times, their focus is different and we're helping the patients to stay alive. I might be washing their feet in the morning and pushing bone marrow stem cells in the afternoon. And, um, and there's moments when a person's not doing well and 
they're afraid to fall asleep at night because they might not wake up. So immersed in transplant nursing and catastrophic illness, I felt at a loss and searching for a deeper understanding of the sufferings my patients were going through. Various times over the years, I would come across the scripture. In my flesh, I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church. I would reflect, but I didn't understand. I was puzzled. It seemed counterintuitive. Does this mean that the redemption achieved by Christ is not complete? Questions began to arise on the meaning of suffering I was witnessing on a daily basis. I eventually encountered upon an apostolic letter of John Paul II called Savavici Dolores on the Christian meaning of human suffering. The Holy Father wrote this letter in 1984 as a response to the suffering he endured when he suffered gunshot wounds of May of 1981. I'll pause for a moment and when I talked to Maria on the phone about what I was going to talk about and you know if Marie said to me Scott you know I want you to talk about the meaning of human suffering and my response would be yikes you know I would like to say I, I can't do that and uh, and she didn't ask me to do that she gave me the latitude to talk whatever I wanted to about but the talk evolved into that, I guess, because of the type of nursing care I did and uh, the type of care that Dr. Sobeck does in trans being a transplant physician. So we're going to do this with John Paul II, and he's going to walk us through it and help us understand, and help us understand how important it is to understand the meaning of human suffering and how it can affect us and to make us deeper caring health care providers. So St. John Paul II goes through the meaning of Christian suffering by presenting the following. The world of human suffering, the quest for an answer to the question of human suffering, Jesus Christ suffering conquered by love, sharers in the suffering of Christ, the gospel of suffering, and the Good Samaritan. Suffering is inseparable from earthly existence. Sometimes we bring suffering on ourselves, but often it can be caused from unexpected illness, natural disasters, famine, loneliness, abandonment, catastrophic injury. Human suffering evokes compassion. For all of us in the healthcare profession, we are drawn to this response of offering compassion to those suffering with illness, as well as the clinical aspect of medicine. Anytime I ask a young nursing student doing a clinical rotation on why they went into nursing, the universal response is to help others. They want to experience its intrinsic value. It intimidates. This certainly hit home with me. No matter how many years of nursing I had at the bedside, and that's many years, you know, I've been in nursing for 30 years, I would be driving to work and have an uneasy feeling, I guess a bit nervous or trepidation before I'd be going into work, knowing the complex situations I would be immersed in, whether it was technical or that of a suffering situation. John Paul II says it so eloquently. It intimidates. It certainly does and always will. By faith and need of the heart, we are called to respond. When I think of the need of the heart and faith, these two words together ask me to overcome the intimidation and the fear. Suffering can be identified in physical suffering, moral suffering, spiritual suffering and psychological suffering. 
when we talk about human suffering, it is inseparable both in our personal lives and in our work as healthcare professionals. And suffering remains an intangible mystery. It remains to be one of man's deepest questions. Suffering is multidimensional. There is the distinction between physical suffering and moral suffering. Physical suffering when the body is hurting and spiritual suffering, pain of the soul. Suffering is wider than sickness. It is more complex and at the same time more deeply re rooted in humanity itself. In healthcare, when we witness suffering, it evokes a response in us, whether we are a nurse, a doctor, a chaplain, social worker, all of the different disciplines that may be here today. And that response draws out of us to be compassionate. Why? As a nurse, or any one of us here, have encountered a patient, a friend, family, asking, why does this happen to me? I am 25 years old. I have leukemia. I might not be alive following my induction therapy at the end of the month. Will I achieve a remission? Then what? A bone marrow transplant. Will I survive? Can I have children? I hurt both physically and emotionally. I don't understand why. Is it something I did? I always took care of myself. I'm a good person. John Paul II talks about the frustrations and the conflicts people have with God, even to the point of denying God. And I think we've heard all of this before from people we might know that they pull away from God, or maybe even some of us, or myself personally, when you are hurt deeply and you just don't understand why. And God's image becomes obscured. John Paul II tells us that is why there is such an importance to address this question of the meaning of suffering. And care must be taken in both dealing with the question of itself and with all possible answers to it. John Paul II stresses to the importance of getting to the truth. He then takes us to the book of Job that can help us begin to understand A just man is tried by innumerable sufferings. He loses his possessions, his sons, his daughters, and finally himself by grave illness. His friends come by while he's going through this terrible time and try to convince Job that since he was struck down by such terrible sufferings, he must have done something wrong. His friends believe and try to convince him that suffering can only have a meaning as a punishment for sin. It is true that suffering has a meaning as punishment when it is connected with a fault and has the nature of a punishment. But it is not true that all suffering is a consequence of a fault and has the nature of a punishment. When it comes to the why, it is sufficient to say that suffering is not to be unreservedly linked to the moral order based on justice alone. The book of Job poses in a very acute way the why of suffering. It also shows us that suffering strikes the innocent, but does not give us the solution to the problem. We experience this so often in healthcare and in our own personal lives. In order to perceive the true answer to the why of suffering, we must look to the revelation of divine love, the ultimate source of the meaning of everything that exists. 
Love is the richest source of the meaning of suffering, which always remains a mystery. Love is also the fullest source of the answer to the question, uh, to the meaning of suffering. And this answer has been given by God to man in the cross of Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that who believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is love for the world, love for man, salvific love, the light of the gospel. Christ's salvific work does not take away human suffering in the world, but it throws a light on the gospel and the salvation of man. These words spoken by Christ in his conversation with Nicodemus introduces us into the very heart of God's salvific work. God giving his only begotten son strikes at the root of sin and suffering. The life of Jesus Christ is in which he ministered to the suffering and those who needed help. Christ's life consisted of one which he healed the sick consoled the afflicted, fed the hungry, freed people from deafness, deafness, from blindness, from leprosy, from the devil, and from various disabilities. Three times he restored the dead to life. Christ was sensitive to every human suffering, whether it was of the body or of the soul. Which brings us to the Beatitudes, which are an address to the people who are suffering in this life. Blessed are the poor in spirit, and the afflicted, and those who hunger and thirst for justice, and those who are persecuted for justice sake when they insult them. Christ drew close to the world of human suffering through the fact of taking this suffering upon himself. By means of this suffering, he must bring it about that man should not perish, but have eternal life. By means of the cross, he strikes at the root of evil, and the cross will accomplish the work of salvation. This work, this plan of eternal love has a redemptive character. Christ suffers voluntarily and suffers innocently. Christ gives the answer to the question about suffering and the meaning of suffering, not only by his teaching, that is by the good news, but most of all, his own suffering. And this is the final definitive word of this teaching, the word of the cross. Human suffering has reached its culmination in the passion of Christ. S suffering has entered into a completely new dimension and a new order. It has been linked to love and to that love. Thank you. linked to love and to that love of which Christ spoke to Nicodemus, to that love which creates good, drawing it out by means of suffering. Just as the supreme good of the redemption of the world was drawn from the cross of Christ, and from the cross constantly takes its beginning. The cross has become a source from which flows rivers of living water. Christ lived a life of humiliation, loneliness, and pain. St. John Paul II teaches us the answer to suffering is divine love and how the cross conquers. Christ's life focused on his love and compassion for those in pain, 
lives of suffering in various ways, and those that are abandoned. The passion of Christ reveals all human suffering has found a new situation. And the cross of Christ not only is the redemption accomplished through suffering, but human suffering is also redeemed. Each man is called to share in that suffering through which the redemption was accomplished. Christ has raised human suffering to the level of the redemption. St. John Paul II explains that the weakness of all human sufferings are capable of being infused with the same power of God manifest, manifested in Christ's cross. The Christians in the early church and man in general finds in the resurrection a completely new light which helps them to go forward through the thick darkness of humiliations, doubts, hopelessness, and persecution. We see in our patient care the exposure to the unknown their illness or injury may present. It can be a most difficult time for families and the patients, waiting for tests to come back, waiting for a diagnosis. Will the bone marrow biopsy reveal no evidence of disease? To suffer means to become susceptible, particularly open to the workings of salvific powers of God offered to humanity in Christ. Yet if one suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but under that same at, under that name, let him glorify God. The Apostle Paul tells this, birth of power in weakness. For those who live the vocation and sharing in Christ's sufferings, we rejoice in our suffering knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. St. John Paul II takes us back to his opening words from Scripture. In the letter to the Colossians, we read the words which constitute, as it were, the final stage of the spiritual journey in relation to suffering. Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church. Does this mean that the redemption achieved by Christ is not complete? If Father Chris was here, he, I need his bounding no, okay, no. It means that the redemption accomplished through love remains always open to all love expressed in human suffering. The redemption which has already been accomplished, but also in a certain sense, constantly being accomplished. Christ opened himself to every human suffering and constantly does so. Christ did not bring it to a close when the redemption was achieved. In its own unique way, this redemption, even though completely achieved by Christ's suffering, does live on. We come to a place of meaning when the Holy Father states, it lives and develops as the body of Christ, the church. And in this dimension, every human suffering, by reason of the loving union of Christ, completes the suffering of Christ. It is only within this radius and dimension of the church as the body of Christ. At the side of Christ in the first most exalted place is his mother through the exemplary testimony that she bears by her whole life to the gospel of suffering. Already in her heart exists what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. <clears throat> 
keep in mind, John Paul II tells us, down through the centuries and generation, it has been seen that in suffering, there is concealed or hidden a particular power that draws a person interiorly to Christ as a special grace. To the suffering brother or sister, Christ discloses and gradually reveals the horizons of the kingdom of God. And Christ, through his own salvific suffering, is very much present in every human suffering and can act within that suffering by the power of the spirit of truth, his consoling spirit. Over a gradual period of time, one can see a transforming peace and hope when suffering from an illness. The consoling spirit of God is within them. It is suffering more than anything else which clears the way for the grace which transforms human souls. At the bedside, I have witnessed so many times when a patient encounters a devastating cancer diagnosis. In a sudden fashion, their life is turned upside down. Their journey is painstakingly gradual. There's a feeling of uselessness of the suffering they are going through. It consumes their interior. They feel a burden to others, useless to oneself. But over time, we witness the transformation of peace and hope. The church sees in Christ's sufferings, brothers and sisters, a multiple subject of supernatural powers. And so in the gospel of suffering, we have the unceasing words of the strange paradox. The springs of divine power gush forth precisely in the midst of human weakness. Traveling along the road from Jerusalem to Jericho lays a half-dead man, stripped and beaten by robbers. The peril of the Good Samaritan, Christ wished to give an answer to this question. Who is my neighbor? The notion of the Good Samaritan must be man's response to our suffering neighbor. A Good Samaritan fits every individual who is sensitive to the suffering of others. Our professions of nurse, physician, social worker, and all the disciplines we do is that of the Good Samaritan, compassion, sympathy, and in action. We come to a familiar text in the Gospel of Matthew. We frequently hear St. Mother Teresa speak so many times. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was in prison, and you came to see me. Christ is telling us to follow the example of the Good Samaritan. As mentioned earlier, when we encounter suffering in our patients, their families, and life in general, it evokes compassion in our hearts. One can say, that suffering is in the world in order to give birth to works of love to our neighbor. We circle back to earlier in the talk to discover all the basis of human sufferings, the same redemptive suffering of Christ. Christ said, you did it to me. Christ himself is present in the suffering person, since his salvific suffering has been opened once for all to every human suffering. And all those who suffer have been called once and for all to be sharers in Christ, Christ's sufferings, just as all have been called to complete with their own suffering what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. At one and the same time, Christ taught man to do good by his suffering and to do good to those who suffer. It is in this double aspect Jesus Christ has completely revealed the meaning of suffering. 
I would like to move on to the life of John Paul II and how his life and the his life itself gives us, uh, helps us understand the meaning of, uh, of suffering. And as we'll see in his life, he was no stranger to suffering. At the age of nine, his mother had died. His brother Edmund was a medical doctor and died of scarlet fever he caught from a patient. Not long after that, his mother died. Then he lived with his father. He was working a heavy labor job. He comes home from work in the afternoon and find his dad dead in their apartment. He was hit by a truck and sustained a bad head injury, his life saved by a good Samaritan walking by. Then there were the years of war and Nazi occupation. In his pastoral ministry, John Paul II was always very close and drawn to those who were suffering with illness. When he was Archbishop of Krakow, he spoke, if someone were to ask me what the foundation is for my pastoral ministry in the Archdiocese of Krakow, I would say that it, to a great extent, it is based on the truth that suffering, that suffering the trials for which many of our brothers and sisters pass is the property of the entire church. It is a good. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Although suffering is an evil, for Christ and in Christ, it is a good. He says to the sick and suffering, so remember you are like him, that we all want to become like him, watching you and drawing from you. St. John Paul II made 104 voyages around the world. There was always a prominent place for the sick up through his last trip, which was to Lourdes. In one of his homilies, he says that every person is created in the limit, image and likeness of God, and nothing can erase this. At the same time, he emphasized that the value of society is determined by the way in which it treats its weakest and most suffering members. During the Angelus on February 11th, 1979, he spoke, so we must stop and pause before suffering, before the person who suffers, to discover this essential link between my sense of personhood and his own. We must pause before the person who suffers, to bear witness to the dignity of suffering. We must bow our heads before our weak and defenseless brothers and sisters who are deprived of what has been granted to us and what we enjoy every day. At the bedside, for us, we must be mindful of how we touch our patients, our smile. Moments of silence and unspoken words is also so important. It is a sacred time when we take this mo those moments to recognize this. It was May, May 13, 1981, during a general audience, St. John Paul II met deep, deep suffering when he was shot by Mehmet Ali Agha. It was 5.19 p.m. when gunshots struck the Holy Father in St. Peter's Square. He was rushed by ambulance to Jameli Hospital and arrived 17 minutes later at 5.36 p.m. His blood pressure was dropping. His vestments were opening, revealing blood-soaked clothing. His skin was cold, sweaty, his blood pressure was dropping. At 5.50 p.m., 31 minutes after the shooting, he was on the op operating table. Archbishop Jeevich imparted to the Holy Father, at this point, the anointing of the sick and absolution. The bullet created multiple internal wounds, including the small and large intestines and massive abdominal hemorrhage. The operation required blood transfusions of a total of 3,150 milliliters, which at least in the United States is nine units of blood. 
providentially, the bullet did not pierce the aorta or the spinal column. His first words after he was awoken in the ICU said with emotion, I pray for the brother who wounded me, whom I sincerely have forgiven. United with Christ, priest and victim, I offer my sufferings for the church and the world. To you, Mary, I repeat, totus to us. I am entirely yours. John Paul II always had a great devotion to Mary and on a, his coat of arms it says totus to us, entrusting Jesus to Mary. He states after much reflection after the event of May 13th, could I forget the event in St. Peter Square's took place on the day and at the time when for over 60 years we have commemorated the first apparition of the Mother of Christ to the humble rural children in Fatima, Portugal. I felt her extraordinary protection and concern which showed itself to be more powerful than the assassin's bullet. The bullet is now welded into the crown of the Mother of Christ in Fatima. Following an ICU stay and a total of three weeks in the hospital, he returned to the Vatican. But then shortly after discharge, he had to return to Gemelli due to a serious CMV infection. At one point, Dr. Buzanetti, his personal physician during his whole pontificate, commented, commented that John Paul II in a physical sense was growing old before his time for all that he had been through thus far in his life. In 1992, he was struck again by another serious illness where a large tumor was found in his large colon requiring a major op result, operation resulting in another long recovery. He found it very difficult to take a time away from his responsibilities in ministry. While he was in the hospital during this period, Mother Teresa wrote this prayer for him. O oh Lord, once again you wanted our Pope John Paul II beside you on the cross to remind the world that only in the cross is their resurrection and life. Through the cross you remind us that you have redeemed the world. The disciple of Christ knows that the work of redemption continues in time and in the life of every man and woman only through the embrace of the cross. With the ailing Pope in the hospital, you, O Lord, show us he too crucified in the flesh, unites himself with all those in the whole world and who bears the marks of the passion of Jesus Christ. The following year, 1993, John Paul II tripped on the hem of his vestments and he fell dislocating his shoulder. Dr. Buzanetti was suspicious of more serious problems and did a thorough medical workup. And he was eventually resulted in the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Another serious fall in his apartment led for the fracture and dislocation of his hip, resulting in a total hip replacement. From that point on, he walked with a cane, and over time, his balance became worse, much less mobile, relying on different types of equipment for him to continue on with his ministry to the church. I think a lot of us who have seen John Paul II on over the years, there was always uh, Archbishop Jevich next to him, and um, uh, you know, unmistakable. And um, so I just wanted to say a few words about him and and kind of a role he played. So he is now a cardinal. He's also been Archbishop of Krakow since 2006. In an article I had read, one can say he's the only elector in the College of Car Cardinals who is now occupied with the second most important job of his life. Because for the 39 years before he was Archbishop of Krakow, Cardinal Jevich serves as the personal secretary of Cardinal Karavoy from 1966 to 1978 as Archbishop of Krakow, and then from 1978 
to 2005, a total of 40 years at the Pope's side. Stripped of all family before he was ordained a priest, John Paul II had no one in his life closer and for, for longer than the young man he himself had ordained, a priest. And in many profiles of the Cardinal, he is described as more of a son than of a secretary. Cardinal Jeevich had shared a lot of, in his writings of the last days of John Paul II's life on earth. And during an Angelus, John Paul II spoke, even here in the hospital, in the midst of sick people, I continue to serve the church and all of humanity. It had been said during the end stage of the Ill illness of the Pope, illnesses of the Pope, he was writing an encyclical without words that he was proclaiming to all the love of Christ, who by dying on the cross accomplished the Father's plan and redeemed the world. Moving ahead to February 2005, the Holy Father was experiencing difficulty breathing. He was diagnosed with inflammation of his larynx, and there were times when he had severe obstructions and he wasn't able to protect his airway. And several times he would be rushed to Jamelli Hospital for emergency treatment. All of this resulted in a tracheostomy to maintain a safe airway. Following the operation, he said, see what they have done to me? Totus to us. Archbishop Jeevich said, it was an expression of amazement and distress at the starry state to which he had been reduced but one immediately elevated to an act of trust in Mary. On March 13th, the Pope returned to the Vatican following the tracheostomy. Easter was approaching for the first time in 26 years. The Pope was not able to preside over the rites of the Easter Triduum. Although he was not there physically, he did send meditations for the faithful. He said, the veneration of the cross brings us back to, commit to a commitment that we must not avoid. It is the mission that St. Saint Saint Paul expre expressed with his words, in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. I also offer, offer up in my own sufferings that the plan of God may be accomplished and his words spread among peoples. On March 27th, Easter Sunday, the Pope stood for almost 13 minutes above St. Peter's Square, which was crowded with members of the faithful waiting for the Easter message. The Pope held a copy of the address in his hands, while the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Angelo Sedano, read its contents in a voice hoarse with emotion from a, the balcony overlooking the square. The Holy Father did try to read the words, but they wouldn't come out. With a sigh, he whispered, I can't speak, and then followed a large sign of the cross. It was his last urtibi et urtibi blessing, which meant to the people, the city, and to the world. The last day of John Paul II's life providentially coincided with the mystery of the passion, death, and resurrection of the Lord. He writes in his will, I ask him to call me back when he himself chooses. In life and death, we belong to the Lord. Then, suddenly on March 31st, sepsis had struck John Paul II. It was evident that the emergent medical care was needed, and it only could be provided in a hospital setting. John Paul II, and also in agreement with his doctors, he made the decision to stay at the Vatican and die at home. His last day of, on earth was April 2nd, 2005. He was alert to say goodbye to those closest to him. In the household were the nurses and doctors, nuns and the priests present. There were prayers throughout the day. Thousands were in St. Peter's Square keeping vigil. Evening came. The voices of the crowd could be heard in his room.
at 8 p.m., Archbishop Stanislav Jevic presided over Holy Mass for Divine Mercy Sunday. Then, at 9.37 p.m., John Paul II departed from this earth. All those present with him at the bedside sang with tears in their eyes the Te Deum, giving thanks to God for the gift of the Holy Father and for his tremendous pontificate. When you think of the timing of his birth, it is incredible how he passed from this life on the very day dedicated to Mary and on the liturgical feast of divine mercy. At this time, I just wanted to say, I found a few, you know, there was some words that I read that um, Pope, Pennett, Pope Benedict had written about the Holy Father, who, and the two of them were very close. And it's a beautiful testimony to St. John Paul II and the Christian meaning of human suffering. No pope has left such a quantity of text as he has bequeathed to us. No previous pope was able to visit the whole world like him and speak to people from all continents. In the end, however, his lot was a journey of suffering and silence. With his words and actions, the Holy Father gave us great thanks. Equally important is the lesson he imparted to us from the chair of suffering and silence. The Pope shows that he was deeply touched by the spectacle of the power of evil, which he dramatically experienced in the century that just ended. Pope Benedict quoted from John Paul II's last book that he had passed out shortly before his death, called Memory and Identity. In his book, he says, the evil was not a small scale evil. It was an evil of gigantic proportions. Is it was an evil availed itself of state structures in order to accomplish wicked work, an evil built up into a system. Might evil be invincible? Is it the ultimate power in history? Because of the experience of evil for Pope Wojtyla, the question of redemption became the essential and central question of his life and thought as a Christian. Is there a limit against which the power of evil shatters? Yes, there is, the Pope replies in his book. The power that imposes a limit on evil is divine mercy. Violence, the display of evil, is opposed in history as the total other of God, God's own power by divine mercy. The lamb is stronger than the dragon, we could say, together, like in the book of Revelation. At the end of the book, in a retrospect review of the attack on May 13, 1981, and on the basis, the experience of his journey with God in the world, John Paul II further deepened this answer. What limits the force of evil? The power, he says. It is God's suffering the suffering of the Son of God on the cross. The suffering of the crucified God is not just one form of suffering alongside others. In sacrificing himself for us all, Christ gave new meaning to suffering, opening up a new dimension, a new order, the order of love. The passion of Christ on the cross radically gave a new meaning to suffering transforming from within. It is this suffering which burns and consumes evil with the flame of love. All human suffering, all pain, all infirmity contains within itself a promise of salvation. The response across the world to the Pope's death was an overwhelming demonstration of gratitude for the fact in his ministry, he offered himself totally to God and to the world. A thanksgiving for the fact that in a world full of hatred and violence, he taught a new love and suffering in the servants of others.
he showed us, so to speak, in the flesh, the Redeemer, redemption, and gave us the certainty that indeed evil does not have the last word in the world. I would like to close to just share that with a deeper understanding of the meaning of human suffering, we can, as healthcare professionals, be able to touch our patients' hearts in a way to give them renewed strength and hope. With this understanding, it happens quietly, silently, to see Christ and the patients we care for. Thank you for listening. Thank you for viewing our program. Please see our website, divinemercymatters.org, for additional educational resources. Thank you.